So as Stephen said, my name is Drew Conway. Um, it may come as a surprise to some that um, I'm actually a political scientist. Uh, I'm in the political science department at NYU. So in keeping with the theme of this being sort of a different conference, I suspect I'm probably the only political scientist in the room. <coughs> no, that's fantastic. That's all right, though. That counts. That's great. Um, wow, that never happens at these conferences. We're going to have lunch together. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> So what I, what I want to talk today uh, a bit about is this idea of, of thinking about questions before going to data and before going to algorithmic solutions and thinking about building something. Because um, this idea of big data and data science uh, has really risen very rapidly over the course of the last couple of years. And part of what's happened over the course of that time is that people have become really focused on tools. And I think tools are really important. Um, but we need to get back to some fundamentals and think about questions. So one of the things that I've done at NYU is uh, with the faculty there in lots of different departments is thought about, well, what would it be like and what would we need to do to try to train people um, in some of these things? So I want to talk a little bit about that and then get to a sort of a case study where Mina, a friend of mine, went through a cycle of doing sort of question asking, data collection, and, re and revisiting, um, and something that I think might be interesting to this crowd. So a little bit of background, because uh, as Stephen mentioned, a little bit about where I come from, but I want to just put it out there so people have a sense of, of where I'm coming from. So before I went to graduate school, I worked uh, in the intelligence community, in the Defense Department. And, and more specifically, I worked in, in those two agencies, which I'm sure you can't see, but that's the Defense Intelligence Agency and the National Security Agency. So I did what we called then computational social science, um, which is sort of roughly called data science now, uh, and that was statistical and algorithmic modeling of human behavior. Um, of course, we had very specific um, data sets and things that we were looking at, but this is really where I learned uh, a lot of the tools that I carried over uh, into the next phase of my life, which was to go to NYU. Uh, I was a computer scientist in my undergrad, uh, but I always found when I was learning about tools that the questions that I was interested in answering were about people. So when I decided to leave my work in DC and go to graduate school, I wanted to find a place where I could actually take the tools that I loved using from computer science and math and statistics and answer questions about people. And through my search, I found NYU's political science department happened to be one of the most sort of quantitative and computational really in the world. So it was a really, really nice fit. Um, from there, when I was there, I met uh, John Miles White, who is a dear friend of mine now. And, and one of the things that we did uh, last year is we wrote a book for O'Reilly called Machine Learning for Hackers. And the idea behind this was to try to present the tools of machine learning um, through case studies. And I thought, and this gets to the idea of asking questions. O oftentimes when people learn these tools, uh, they learn them from a very, very math heavy perspective, which is great. But some people who are practitioners just want to learn the tool themselves and sort of open up the black box. So that's why we decided to write this book. And, and through the course of writing the book and getting to know a lot of people who are much smarter than I, I got to meet um, Stephen. And then when Stephen was in New York, he and I met um, at, our, at my, one of my favorite craft brew places in, in Manhattan called Good Beer NYC. This is actually the growler that I own. I took the picture yesterday morning. Um, so when we got to sit, we, we were sitting down at, at Good Beer and Stephen was telling me about Monktoberfest, I said, that's awesome. That sounds like a great conference. I would love to go. And then, of course, I was very honored for him to ask me to come. So this is how I sort of got to be standing in front of you. Uh, a couple, I guess it's now like a couple years ago, I was just thinking about data science as a discipline uh, and put together this Venn diagram uh, to sort of describe what I thought made up all of the aspects of data science and then you know, at those intersections where other disciplines and other things exist. And one of the things that I want to do during this talk is drill down into each one of those circles and talk about where, how do you get those skills and how we might think about sort of promoting that uh, both from an educational perspective but for many of you in the audience maybe from a hiring perspective or from a training perspective uh, in, your, in your company. So I'll just briefly talk about you know, each one of these things. The, the intersection there of hacking skills and, and math and stats basically is what I think of really traditional machine learning. People who are doing a combination of CS and looking for um, statistical descriptions of natural phenomenon that are happening in the world. And then for me, as a social scientist, you know, much of the training that we get in a traditional research uh, field would be learning something substantive, so you know, poli-sci and its many uh, subfields as well as lots of other things, and then getting the math and statistics knowledge to be able to actually model some of those things and, and, and represent them with data. And then the danger zone is, is one that I, that I think is, is really one of the most interesting ones because unfortunately, 
Uh, it, it happens maybe the most often, which is where people come with some substantive expertise to a problem. They might know um, online advertising, uh, but they also know how to hack around at the command line. They may know some, you know, some scripting languages. So they get a bunch of data, they run a regression, and they say, ha, I have the answer. Right? But they, they, they haven't been trained really to understand and interpret what they're looking at. So that can be one of the most dangerous places to be. And, and what I want to do is talk about how we sort of get people out of that uh, and into that center bit there. So hacking skills. I hold these two things to be self-evident, right? Data come from many sources and data come in many formats. So what do we do, what do I mean by hacking skills and what actually exists in this circle? Well, for me and for many of the people that I know who do this for a, day, for, for a living, that means obtaining data and smudging it. That's scrubbing it, cleaning it up, making it so it's in a usable format. Um, so here's some examples, right? Uh, oftentimes when I'm doing research or I'm working on a problem and are talking to other people doing problem sets, they get data that's called data but isn't anything that you can actually use. So like a very uh, often example, particularly in the social sciences, is like, oh, here's your data set. It's a table and a PDF. Well, that's not really useful to me. So one of the things that we have to learn as, as data scientists or as people who are doing this kind of work is how do I get around these problems? This is, this is the hacking skills. Like how do I actually go and get data? So these two examples here are just short ones, but like this text file, public votes dash 2010-1018, is actually a public dump of all votes from Reddit that month, right? That's a huge file. So if I want to do a quick inspection of what it looks like, I know to use the head command and at the command line, I can just see what's in there. And these are little things. Again, working with APIs, this is a very common cycle that people go through when they're trying to get data. They go out on the internet and they try to find an API that might uh, provide some information. So here's just a curl command to see the last couple of people who tweeted at me on Twitter. And once you have the data, of course, then you have to actually use it. Right? And that can be actually the biggest pain in the ass of all because real data are super messy. Real data have all kinds of problems with them, even if they're really well curated coming from you know, uh, data.gov or coming like I live in New York, coming from the city. They, they come to you as curated, but they have duplicates, they're missing values, the date format's all screwed up. So we have to think about how do we train people to be able to use this data and understand how to clean it up. And some of the things that I think are most useful are really the basic stuff, like set awk and grep right at the command line. I use those all the time. They're great. And then if you want to do you know, more things and, and have more of a robust work form, you might use a scripting language. So this is just, again, an example of uh, a data set that we actually use in the book on UFO sightings. This is just looking for every time the word probe is mentioned uh, in a data set on UFO sightings. And in fact, if you run that command, you get 131 uh, examples of that. Um, but what's interesting here is that you know, we have these three circles, but really 80% of the man hour effort in, a, in what I would consider to be a data cycle or a data science cycle is spent here. It takes a really long time to get the data, but an even longer time to actually get it in a way that's useful. Um, so <clears throat> when we think about actually doing stuff here, while 80% of the effort is spent here, most of the people in this room can tell you that this is actually really one of the more straightforward things that you train people in doing, right? Because people who are interested in doing this probably come from a background where they're familiar with using some of these tools, right? So when I think about talking to people at universities, I say, listen, we can lean on a lot of the current curriculum that exists in computer science and information systems and just try to build up people's comfort with working with big, set, big, big data sets and how to clean them. And this is just sort of an example from my own work. You know, this is kind of the stack of stuff that I use regularly. I, I, use, I use Python and R as my scripting languages because Python is super easy to use and easy to share. R is for statistical modeling, and that's what I use. And then when things get too big to fit in memory, I push it onto Hadoop, and it, and it works there as well. Uh, and then maybe the last piece, the piece that people spend the least amount of time when they're thinking about hacking skills is actually how do you take that analysis once it's done and present it to people in a way that's meaningful. And in fact, that's how I want to end the talk today, is talking about re rethinking some of these presentations and how do you actually tell stories about data. But these are just, again, tools, you know, like, processing, um, D3, which is that middle example there, and then if you're an R user, ggplot. ggplot's a beautiful tool, and we'll see some ggplot a little later. So then we go to the, the second bubble here, which is on math and stats. So I'm gonna steal a quote from Jeff Jonas, which is better data, better data beats better math. Right? We have all this data now, so we can think about using really simple tools on big data to get answers, but then when we think about training, 
what are the methods that we should actually be teaching people in this case? So for me, when I'm doing stuff, I think of this as two phases. One is exploring the data, and then once I've explored it, trying to model something, so actually taking some idea about what's in that data and trying to model that phenomenon. So we need to ask, we need to, to think about what are the actual things that I'm gonna do during the exploration. So we do scatter plots to see if there's relationships between data. We do density plots to see if there's uh, you know, what the modal um, value is in some data set. And then, of course, because we're dealing with really big data, we need to think about how do we actually reduce that down into a, uh, a piece or, or sort of uh, example that's easier to understand or easier to, to model in the next step. So we're going to do lots of dimensionality reduction stuff. So PCA, SVD, MDS, these are just alphabet soup if you're not familiar with them, but they're tools that can be used in statistical methods that can take really high dimensional data and reduce it down to something that's smaller. And once we've done that, we want to be able to model stuff. So one of the things that's often missed in that danger zone that I was talking about is matching the method you're using to the data set that you have. So it doesn't make sense to use linear regression on data that's nonlinear, right? But people do it all the time. And we need to think about if I have text data, should I be using a text regression? Should I be using bag of words? Should I be using um, natural language processing, which you probably never should? Um, but if, you know, these tools exist. And then once you've thought about that, we want to know, well, once I have an idea about what a model is, how do I define what's the best model? And there's lots of ways we can think about doing that, right? What's the most predictive? Which one actually gives me the lowest error rate for my prediction? What's the most parsimonious? Which one where do I have to use the least amount of data to get a prediction? And then once I have that, how do I cross-validate them? How do I compare those models? So these, this, this part of the training is actually the hardest, right? We have to think really hard about how do we train people in doing this kind of thing, right? Universities are good at methods training, right? but they're not really good at methods training in the R of big data and thinking about how do we train people on these methods when their data is coming from many different places. right? So what would we actually do for data scientists, who wanna, who, who, people who want to be data scientists? Well, I think about this as being two different sides of the same coin. So we have shit that data scientists like. Right? There's stuff that they like. Describing the current state of the world. People who, data who do data science really like to say, like, here's my chart that describes the current state of the world. They like to predict future observations. Right? They like to make predictions like, you will like this item on Amazon. They like to do classification. That's spam. That's not spam. They like to rank stuff. Here's the most important email in your inbox. Social scientists like other stuff. Right? We like different things. We like testable theoretical models. This is why incumbents do poorly in debates. There's my theory. Right? Natural experiments. We like to actually go out into the world and say, Here's an experiment that happened out in the world because of some random process that I can observe and collect data on. Right? We really love causality. Spend a couple hours in an economics or political science department and you'll see big lines on whiteboards drawn from X to Y. Because right? we like to say X causes Y. In fact, it's really hard to ever say that, but we like to think about that stuff. So when we're going to talk about training people in data science or hiring people with these skills, really want to think about a combination of where these two things can actually be blended together. Going back to what we were saying before, first we actually want to know, is what I'm trying to do even applicable to the problem that I'm doing? Are these methods or are these data even worthwhile in trying them? If they are, then we should try to pick the right tool for the job. We should, think, we should ha find people who can tell you this is when you want to do MDS, this is a linear regression problem, this is something else. And then once we have that, we want to teach people to be able to open up those black boxes and understand what's going on inside of them. And then, of course, learn the limitations. When is this thing going to break down? And when should I be wary of the results that I'm getting? Okay? So the final piece here is a substantive expertise, which I find to be the most interesting and maybe really the focus of the rest of the talk is thinking about substantive expertise as a way to be inspired to look for interesting questions in the world, right? Because data science to me, and the reason why I think it's so hot now and interesting, is that it's fundamentally about studying human behavior, right? We've had big data sets for a really long time. Talk to any astrophysicist, talk to any um, biologist or chemist, they've had huge data for a really long time and had to think about dealing with it and, and writing models for for it, it's been a much shorter amount of time that we've had big data on human behavior. Now that we have social media platforms, the web in general, um, you know, cellular devices that are keeping track of where we're going, now we have these huge data sets about people, and data science as a discipline is really sort of, I think, hot now because we can take the questions that we never thought we could ask and ask them on big data sets about human beings. So how do we actually think about understanding that and going forward? So first we want to be able to inquire about human behavior, right? We want to focus on questions, not technology, right? So now that we have all this data, what can we actually ask it that's interesting? And I think there's probably a whole set of startups that haven't been 
dreamed up of yet that are based on asking questions about human data that we've never been able to ask before, right? And then to that end, what are the tools that we can use, right? So social science has lots of questions about markets, how do markets work, how do the organize, like political science as a discipline is all about collective action. So how do people organize to make joint decisions? Uh, and there's lots, of there's lots of ways we can think about taking those questions out of the social sciences and into, um, you know, commercial ventures or, or into startups to think about really interesting stuff. And once we have done and asked those questions, how do we interpret the answers, right? And I'm sort of blatantly stealing um, this XKCD comic from, uh, from Sinan Oral, who's a professor at, uh, in the business school at NYU, but I think it's really telling because a lot of people don't think about interpreting results sort of like, well, I learned, that, I learned about correlation and causation, but maybe I don't actually totally understand what's going on here. So how do we know when the results we get even make sense? How do we know when to doubt the results that we're getting? And this, is, this again, is where I want to focus on what we've been doing because 80% of the man-hour work that you're going to do in this cycle is going to be on sort of collecting and munging data, but 80% on the thinking work, the stuff that takes a, lot, takes a lot of brain power, is going to be on observing the natural world or observing what's happening out in, the, out in space and saying, ah, there's a phenomenon that I think is interesting. I'd like to measure that and then try to take that measurement and ask an interesting question. And that's, that to me is the hardest thing because it's very, very hard to train people to do that. I mean, as a PhD student, they spend four or five years trying to hammering in your head, how do you actually ask interesting questions? And only 20% of people who try it actually are successful, or maybe even less, but sort of statistics about people making it through graduate programs will say it's about an 80% loss. So that is really, really hard to do, and we need to think about that. So I want to finish here, or at least the second half, to talk about a case study where I think this is an interesting case about asking questions, answering a different one, and now going back and trying to actually answer the question that started. And this sort of subheading here is how um, how my friends and I spent hours hacking through messy data to answer seemingly trivial questions. Um, so many of you may have seen this chart. Uh, <clears throat> this is a chart that John Miles White and I created, uh, I guess, almost two years ago now, uh, when we had the question, how do you rank the popularity of programming languages? Because it's like, people always think, this programming language is the most popular. No, this one is. Lots of people have lots of different sort of qualitative answers about why they think a programming language is popular. We wanted to actually have a quantitative look at this. So what we did is we said, well, if I'm thinking about answering that question, what's the other question that I'm trying to answer? And before I do that, I should just say sort of exactly what this is. So on the x-axis there, that's the popularity of rank on GitHub by the number of projects that are in a, in a certain language. And actually, GitHub has an API that you can query and it will actually tell you this is the rank for a programming language. And then on Stack Overflow, this is just the number of questions tagged. Well, this, so this is the rank by number of questions tagged in a certain language. So you can go to GitHub and if you go to the JavaScript tag, it'll say X hundred thousand questions have been tagged with JavaScript. If you collect all that data, you of course can convert it into a rank and that's what we've done here. So the the line here is nice, right? We see this really strong linear relationship for programming languages uh, in terms of these ranks. So <clears throat> we thought this was great. We have a 0.78 uh, Spearman's correlation, which is used for uh, comparing ranks. Really, really interesting. The, the horizontal or the diagonal line there can help you sort of identify outliers on either side. And then Stephen and Red Monk have sort of taken this idea and built on top of it and continue to do it and, and, and put out new versions of this uh, every so often to show how things have changed. And of course, that makes us really excited because then we had an interesting idea. We spent an evening at Princeton sort of hacking through this and then other people found it interesting enough to continue on with it. But I just want to talk a little bit about the process by which we went through posing that question, then getting the answer, and now sort of thinking back, well, did we actually answer what we wanted to? So right, we started out with this question of, how would you rank the popularity of a programming language? That's a really hard thing to do. So when John and I were sitting there thinking, well, how would we do that? The next natural thing to actually answer is, well, how can we actually measure what a programming language's popularity is? And then, of course, looking at the graph, the way we measured that was by counting tags and by, count, and by looking at the rank of by number of projects. Right? So, but what do we actually do? We actually did was compare the number of question tags and project tag. So like, the reason I put this chart the way it is is like we're pretty, we've, we had an abstract question and we got pretty far away from it over the course of trying to answer it and create that chart. Maybe there's a way that we can go back and try to get further up the chain on the abstraction. So the chart's really good at doing the comparison. We don't actually learn anything about rank. What we really learn is that there's a linear relationship. 
All right, so that's cool. That's interesting that there's a linear relationship. But if we want to go back and say, how can we measure a programming language popularity, let's think of a different way that's not linear. That's not a linear correlation. That's not a linear scatter plot. So what I did a couple days ago as I was preparing for this talk is I sat down and I thought, well, what might be a better way to actually show how these two measures can give you a rank comparison? So, oh, so I would say that we answered this question, we didn't answer this question, how can we get closer to the answer to this question? So in order to do that, I went back and said, all right, how can I rethink this data, think about it in a more explicitly about ranking, not just linear relationships? So I came up with this. All right, so this is a different visualization uh, of the data. So I don't expect any of you to be able to read what, that's, what the languages say, but I'll explain a little bit about what's going on here and why I think it's more useful as a way of thinking about ranking. So uh, the, left, the left column there are, again, GitHub ranks by number of projects. The right column there is, again, Stack Overflow ranks by the number of projects. And this is what we call a slope graph. This is like an Edward Tufte style slope graph. I'm sure some of you have heard of Edward Tufte, sort of famous for his visualization techniques. Um, the slope graph is typically used to show changes in gradients over time. What I'm doing here is using it to show changes in ranks. Um, because if you draw a line from one rank to the other, the more parallel it is to the x-axis, the closer the ranking is. Uh, and now a little bit uh, on the rest of this. So I took all the data that we had from the previous example, that scatter plot of x and y, and did a very simple k-means clustering of all the programming languages. So those colors there correspond to clusters of, uh, of programming languages. And I just said, you know, for those of you who are familiar with k-means, I just said five centers, I want five clusters. Right? And didn't, just totally out of the box, didn't try to mess around or monkey around with the k-means clustering. And this is what it gave me. And then the gray bands are actually the percentiles, or the quartiles, between the five percentiles. So all the way at the top is the 100th percentile, and then it splits by gray all the way down. So I'll tell you what I noticed. I'd love to hear things that you guys notice in this. But first, there's actually quite a strong relationship between these two measures, particularly at the high end. And we can see some very obvious tiering that happens here. So we're thinking about ranking, and I want to get back and closer to this idea of ranking programming languages. I thought one way to do it would be to show tiers of languages, not be specific about a language over another, but say, what tier of a language are you based on these two measures? So we can see up in the 100th percentile, there is clearly like a top tier. Those are those purple lines, right? Those, those are all up there, except for two languages that, that cross over. One is CoffeeScript, and one is R. Right. For the rest of the languages, they are all in, the, in that top tier there, and they're all picked up by k-means to be in that, sin that single cluster. Likewise, this sort of um, teal colored uh, group here is the second tier of languages. Right. So very clearly, very solidly in that 80th to, a, to or sorry, 60th to 80th percentile right, of languages. Right there in that second tier, strong group of, of languages there, second tier popularity. Right, and, this, and then I want to skip ahead to the bottom. There's also this very strong sort of bottom of the list, least popular languages. Right? So we're thinking about top, second, and least popular tier. And then what's really interesting here is you have these two other groups that are a bit harder to understand. So I'll start with the fuchsia one. Uh, I had to look up these colors. So there's a fuchsia line. Um, <clears throat> the fuchsia line, I think, are languages for which this measure and this technique do not tell you anything. Right? This is not a useful way of classifying these languages because they're completely incomparable. You have languages in the 100th percentile down, down all the way to the 0th percentile for languages that, like Vimal, which we learned from the first exercise, it, I guess GitHub is like the place to do Vimal and the only place to do it. Um, so comparing it to any other site is sort of silly because there's nowhere else that it exists. So you can see that it goes from you know, being in the top 10 there to 0. Uh, and I should say, sorry, that these little breakouts just represent ties. Those languages are tied for ranks. Um, and there's lots of examples where these slopes are just down. And the fuchsia group, you know, if I was looking at this, I'd say, for purposes of this measure, we have to throw them out because we're not getting any information about them from this. And then the green group, uh, sort of calling this high variance group because there's something going on here, right? They are all basically in the 60th percentile. Uh, all the way down, and they cluster nicely between 20 and 60, but there is a high amount of variance there. So this actually may be the most interesting tier if you're thinking about how do I track languages as they become more popular or become less popular. What is it about the languages in this group that put them there, and you know, through the work of Stephen and the other guys, thinking about how do we track this, this tier over time. So after I looked at this chart, I said, all right, in the, in the 
with the idea of further abstraction, we can think about it like, oh, sorry, there's still a very strong correlation, just so people, sometimes when you look at it this way, you forget that there might be. So that linear correlation is still really strong, it's still there. Um, so I thought about it this way, right? If we're gonna take that information and try to actually define or answer the question of how do you rank languages, we can think about it like this. There are effectively three tiers of languages for which this kind of measure is useful. Your most popular, your second most or middle popularity, and your least uh, most popular. And then those gray bands there again represent those quartiles, but we can think about throwing that, that out or leaving it in if it's useful for people to understand what's going on here. And then we take that bubble of in incomparable languages and we just throw it out. We're not gonna use it anymore for this measure because those languages, we're not getting any information. And then I put the high variance group to the side because I said this actually may be the place that we wanna focus our attention. That's, those are the languages that I think we really wanna think why are they there, what's going on there. So just for completeness, this is the group membership of those languages so people can see it. Um, I have a very specific tool set I don't know or have ever or probably will ever program in 90% of these languages. In fact, those are the languages that I program in, JavaScript, Python, Perl, and the shell, because I think probably everybody does a little bit of the shell. Uh, so I'm not really qualified to answer that question of how, why are these languages here, particularly in this green high variance group. So I wanted to leave this out there to the crowd and say, you know, why do you think they are? What would the, what, how would you answer the question, sorry, as question askers and answerers about why those languages exist where they do. And I just put this, this is my blog, uh, let's see, through the wonders of WordPress, this entry will be online in about 30 seconds. So you can go download that picture um, and check it out for yourself to see if it's interesting to you. Um, so that, that's, that's the presentation, um, just the idea of training, asking questions, getting the data, and then doing that cycle again. So now, you know, John and I did the linear regression once, went, came back to it a year later and said, you know, I didn't really answer the question. So I came back, did it again, and now I'm faced with a whole other set of questions, which is why do languages exist in each one of these tiers? And I'd be very curious to talk to people sort of offline or whatever why they think certain things are. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to meeting people.